so welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about the human voice as a musical instrument. And I want to start by reminding you that the various other instruments we've talked about, including some of the stringed instruments and the wind instruments, we can kind of divide those up into two parts. We have a cavity, like the tube that a wind instrument utilizes, where you have standing wave oscillations inside the tube, or also the body of a violin or a guitar, we have oscillations inside that cavity. And then we have a way to drive those oscillations. And in the case of the wind instruments, we had the examples of reeds, we had the examples of the air jets used in recorders and flutes, and we had the examples of the lips being used for playing brass instruments. So for the instrument of the human voice, we have a similar kind of situation where in this case, the cavity is what we call the vocal tract. And that includes the nasal cavity, the oral cavity or your mouth, and part of your throat called the pharynx. And so various kinds of oscillations exist in that cavity when you are talking or singing. And these ultimately drive the sound waves in the outside air uh, through because that cavity contacts the outside air at your mouth and your nose. So how do we drive the oscillations in terms of using the human voice as a musical instrument? Well, it's almost like you have a pair of lips inside your throat. So there's something called your vocal folds or commonly called vocal cords, which operate a lot like a pair of lips that would be used in playing a brass instrument. And so in this video, we're going to focus on how we generate sound with the vocal folds. But I want to emphasize before the next video where we're going to focus on the, this cavity, that the cavity is actually operating more like the cavity of a violin or a guitar rather than the cavity of a wind instrument. And the reason is that our, our vocal cavity doesn't have very sharp, specific frequencies that it wants to oscillate at, that the air inside wants to vibrate at. It's more of a situation where you have a broad range of frequencies that can exist inside the cavity. And just certain frequencies are a little bit more resonant than other frequencies. Okay, so it's a little bit more like the case of the violin body where you want to design that so that it can support lots of different vibration frequencies. Okay, so let's carry on and talk about the origin of sound in singing and talking, uh, which is the vocal folds. So the vocal folds are basically this, this fleshy organ inside your throat. It's at the top of your trachea in what's called the larynx or your voice box. And here you can see actual pictures of these vocal folds. So this, these come from the sides of your throat and depending on whether you're breathing or whether you're talking or singing, they might be open. So that's shown on the right when you were breathing. Then there's a big opening, which is called the glottis. Or these vocal folds could be closed where the two sides come together. And so that's the situation that we're in when we're singing or when we're talking. Okay, so it's very much like your lips coming together to make a note when you're playing the trumpet. Like that. Okay, it sounds nicer though when, with your vocal cords. Okay, so the physics of making that oscillation of your vocal folds is pretty much the same as we discussed for the trumpet for how your lips work. And so a way to understand that is you're going to increase the pressure inside your windpipe. And if you're talking about the situation where your vocal cords, cords maybe start completely closed together, then that pressure increases until at some point it's enough to force the vocal folds open. 
So that's what you see in the diagrams here. But then the vocal folds are springing, number one, so they, they will want naturally to come back together when that pressure releases. So as, as the pressure um, increases and then you have air moving through the vocal folds, then at that point there's a decrease in pressure. And so now the springy forces of the vocal folds take over and they bring the vocal folds back together. There's another little bit of physics, as we mentioned with the lips, called Bernoulli's principle. And that's the principle where if you have fast moving air, that's associated with a drop in pressure. Okay, and so if you want to understand the physics of airplanes and why they get up off the ground, that uses Bernoulli's principle. If you have faster moving air above the airplane wing than below it, and so you have less pressure on top of the airplane wing, more pressure below the airplane wing, and that leads to the airplane lifting off the ground or staying up in the air. And that so that pressure is um, the difference in pressure below and above is giving you an upward force that counteracts the force of gravity. OK, so that's another effect happening in your vocal folds as that air goes through in pictures four, five, six here. The pressure in between drops and then you're going to have that extra effect, this Bernoulli effect causing the vocal folds to come back together. The outside pressure will then drive them back together. So those two forces, the pressure forces and then the springiness forces in the vocal folds themselves. Okay, and so you can control that vibration because you have muscles that control various features of your vocal folds. Okay, so just like you can control the frequency of vibration of your lips. Well, it's easier with the trumpet mouthpiece. Let me not try that anymore. Uh, so you can control that frequency, especially if you're a brass player, uh, you can control, you have a large amount of control over the frequency of your vocal folds. Okay, and so let me tell you that the two ways that you have in order to control those vocal folds. Okay, this is probably a little bit of a simplification, um, but roughly speaking, there are two types of muscles that are involved in controlling the vocal folds once, once they're together. And so the first type is a muscle that's actually inside these vocal folds called the vocalis muscle. And when this contracts, when that muscle contracts, then your vocal folds actually shorten and they get thicker and they get stiffer. And what that means is that in this oscillation, the frequency of that oscillation is going to be higher because, because the folds themselves are stiffer, they're going to want to come back together more quickly. Okay. And so that's one type of muscle that controls the vocal folds. But there's another type of muscle, uh, the, the cricothyroid muscles, which are external to the vocal folds. And so you can think of those as stretching the folds from the outside. So if we relax the vocalis muscle and then use these cricothyroid muscles, then the vocal folds, they stretch out, they get longer, they get thinner and they get tighter. And so it's much like stretching a rubber band and then the natural frequency that those want to vibrate at and that they're going to vibrate at in this cycle is going to be higher. Okay. And so you have various ways of singing that use these muscles in different ways. So I'm going to talk about the two main ways that we usually control our voice. Uh, one of them is called the modal register or M1. And the other one is called the falsetto register or M2. So these are these are the kind of more scientific names for these two different ways of singing. And so we'll start with the modal register. And that is where actually both types of muscles are used. So the modal register usually is associated with the lower end of your range. And so in that case, especially at the, the low end of the modal register, you're mostly using these vocalis muscles. So you're mostly, in order to get higher frequencies, 
you're just making the vocal folds a little bit stiffer and that causes the frequency of their vibration to increase. As you go higher and higher in the modal register, then you also start using the cricothyroid muscles. And so in addition to this stiffening, you're stretching them. And so that increases the frequency even more. And so the combination of these things tends to produce the richest tones that we can produce when we're singing. So compared to the other register, the vocal folds tend to be more tightly closed in this modal singing. And so it's like that when we talked about the saxophone, the louder volume saxophone playing when the reed actually was uh, closing off the mouthpiece for a larger fraction of the time, that tends to produce a sound wave which is less and less sinusoidal, so more, um, uh, more harmonics are going to be present. Okay, so it's, it's a more complicated time graph and you're gonna get more harmonics and that's associated with a richer tone. Now, in the other way of singing, uh, we can, which is called a falsetto, usually at least when it's applied to men, women also have this mode of singing. And in that case, it's usually, or sometimes called the head voice. Okay. So in this case, it's something where your vocal, your vocalis muscles, okay, so the vocal folds themselves are more relaxed. And basically you're just using these other muscles, these cricothyroid muscles to stretch the vocal folds from the outside. Okay, so the, the vocal folds are more passive here. You're stretching them. And as they stretch longer and tighter and they get thinner, they vibrate with a higher frequency. Okay, and so in this kind of singing, what tends to happen is that these folds are closed for less of the cycle. And actually in many people, they don't completely close at all. And so it's more like, if you recall, the low volume saxophone playing where the reed doesn't actually close off the mouthpiece. And so in this case, the oscillations of your vocal folds are more like a sinusoidal oscillation. So more like simple harmonic motion. And as a result, the tone that you produce is more like a pure tone. Okay. So it's a little bit less uh, rich than, than the modal voice. Okay, so I'll just quickly demonstrate singing in various registers. Apologies in advance that you have to be subjected to this. But here we go. So this is me singing in my modal voice. And now I can actually sing the same notes in falsetto. So. So those overlap for a certain range of frequencies. But the falsetto, I can sing much higher than my modal voice. So if I start. And the modal voice, I can go down much lower than I can with a falsetto. So. Just to show you what the vocal folds might look like there there's a little bit of an uh, animation that i've got from wikipedia here so you can see the difference in the modal register um, this, this is probably not completely accurate um, but it's just indicating that in the modal register more of your vocal folds are being activated and the vocal folds are together for a longer period of time whereas in the falsetto register you see that uh, a lot of your vocal folds are just passive when you're singing falsetto and um, the, the vocal folds are kind of just touching each other a little bit um, during that oscillation. Okay. So this is a kind of a diagram that summarizes that. This is just showing you um, the range of frequencies and the range of loudnesses that are covered by 
the modal voice and the falsetto voice for like I've given some example of some individual. So this is going to be different for everyone. Uh, the different types of singers, tenor, baritone, bass, they're going to be distinguished by the range of frequencies that these things cover. Okay, so this is just one example of a female singer and a male singer. And so what you see again is that with the modal voice, that's being used for the lowest end of the singing. And then the falsetto voice allows you access to the highest pitches that you could sing. Uh, although the, some women have access to this extra register called the whistle register. Mariah Carey is famous for that. And uh, that, that involves a different mechanism than the falsetto. Okay. But you see as well, they, they overlap. And in the region where they overlap, then the loudest singing would be using the modal voice and the quietest you could sing would be using your falsetto. Okay. So an interesting thing as an activity, you can actually feel these vibrations of your vocal cords. If you, if you touch the, the, your throat while you're talking or while you're singing, uh, so you can, you can kind of locate the place where your vocal folds are because you feel a strong vibration at that place. Now there's one other, I just mentioned uh, before I finish, there's one other mode. So I mentioned the modal and the falsetto are the most typical registers or modes of singing that we use. And I mentioned that certain people have access to this whistle register, which, which is an even higher frequency set of notes. Um, there's another way that we can vocalize, which is more used for certain kinds of talking. Uh, th so that's referred to as M0, and this is vocal fry or, uh, or creaky voice. So that would sound something like this. Okay, so you can maybe sing a little bit, but it's, it's used uh, certain times when, when you're speaking, and so you'll hear that sometimes as well. So that's M0, M1 is modal, M2 is falsetto, and then M3 is the name that's given to this whistle register. Okay, so in the next video, we're gonna talk about how this sound produced by your vocal folds in one of these methods basically then is driving oscillations in your vocal tract, and we'll understand the effect of the vocal tract on the final sound that is produced when you're singing.